are all, you know, legitimate questions which are not being asked. Well, Daniel, in a way, asked Calero in the final questions if he'd heard the stories about the Contras running drugs and if he himself was involved in the drug running operations. And Calero said, yes, he heard the stories, but they were lies. And no, he'd never had anything to do with um, drugs. And then, in a way, dropped it. Yeah, and that that's, was the end of that's testimony. The, see, they get it on the record and he denies it and, they, and in a way, dropped it. And see, yeah. that's the, the touch that they're using in this thing. So, to cover themselves, yes, we asked that question. But they didn't ask it the way a Senate committee would ask it right. if, if they were trying to get to the bottom of it. And what about this? And what about this individual? Now, in fact, you know this individual. Now, this man is, you know, caught in San Francisco with 40 pounds of cocaine. You know, and he was, in fact, associated with you. Are you denying that you knew him? Uh, and, you know, remind him, you're under oath, you know. If you deny that you knew him and we find that you did, you know, I mean, they, there's just, they're just glossing over this stuff. Well, the heavy question. Now, you have had some success and some non-success in getting information into the establishment media, New York Times and the L.A. Times. Can you tell us about this? Uh, you mean me in my present incarnation <laughs> recently, yeah. yeah. I was also successful <laughs> 10 years ago <laughs> no, I mean, in getting disinformation. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I, I have gotten uh, a New York Times op-ed and a Los Angeles Times op-ed, uh, mostly focusing on Oliver North. And, and uh, you know, just initially, uh, the Oliver North network and the activities. Uh, but I've since been circulating a draft of, of a piece that's asking why the questions are not being asked by the Senate, by the investigators. And the New York Times, I'll give them credit, they kept it for two weeks. I mean, assassinations of world leaders. And drugs. And drug running, for example. And, and the, the bombing of, of uh, for example, Secord selling material to the Contras. You know, General Secord, did you sell any C4 plastique to the Contras? Is a legitimate question because this is what was used to blow up an American journalist, uh, you know, and a couple of dozen other people uh, in La Penca, Nicaragua. And so that's a legitimate question. Did you sell them any C4? Are you aware of any C4 being sold to them? Uh, these questions not being asked. The New York Times kept it for two weeks, and they definitely had some editors who, who wanted to run it. It's a very forceful piece. And eventually the others prevailed, and I, d I had no idea of who the personalities were one way or the other. Was but it the bosses that didn't like it and the underlings did? or Well, clearly that? somebody with authority must <coughs> have been against it because they didn't run it. If yeah. it had been the bosses who, who favored it, it would have run eventually, a hierarchy being as it is. But the fact that they agonized about it for two weeks and there was some dissension, uh, you know, there are people in there who would like to see the questions asked. And I was explaining if the media... It won't ask the questions. You know, what hope is there that the politicians will? And I was getting very sympathetic responses, but the piece didn't run. And then I called it into the Los Angeles Times mm -hmm. this afternoon and uh, talked to the, one of the editors in the op-ed page there, and I got yelled at. I got berated. Oh, oh indeed. He, was, he, he called me a 60s radical, the worst kind of 60s radical thinking, trying to build a case out of poppycock. Oh, yeah, he was going on and allowed, I don't have to put up with this from someone like you, he said. And uh, I was saying, wait a minute, you know, this is me. And during the 60s, I pointed out to him the, the 60s radicalism. You know, I was inside doing these things and getting medals for it. And uh, he, just, he just glossed over that. At one point, he was throwing out such spacious arguments uh, that I, I just told him, I said, that's inane. Like what did he say? Well, he said, when I was listing the world leaders that have been killed, in some cases, are, are targeted by the Reagan administration. The White House has admitted one, two others, there's evidence, and then there's several others. And I was running through these briefly. And he said, my father died of a heart attack. Why don't you throw him in? And I said, what does that have to do with Reagan and political assassinations? Was he a world leader opposed to the Reagan doctrine? And he said, well, you seem to be trying to throw in everything else in the world. Everybody that's ever died, he said. And I said, I said, you know, that's inane. Well, he ran your stuff before. Why he is, ran my why, stuff why before. Why is this flip-flop? Well, I had, I had been warned that he individually was very temperamental. Oh. And when I talked to him the previous time, he was such, so cordial and... and 
easy to work with that I presume there was just some kind of misunderstanding and mm. this time I met the testy temperamental editor I and, think uh, there was something else we did a report that the Los Angeles Times has been more critical of Reagan's foreign policy in particular the Central American policy than the New York Times or the Washington Post but when it comes to a more fundamental critique mm -hmm. of US policy such as the policy of carrying out political assassinations that goes beyond their tolerance point I think they, yet, they just won't uh, yeah, accept and, and yet some, you have the White House staffers admitting that the bombing of Libya, they were targeting Qaddafi. Right. You have 70, uh, as Cy Hirsch put it in his New York Times magazine piece on the 22nd of February, 70 Air Force officials and White House staffers admitted to him that they were targeting Qaddafi himself. They call it leadership targeting. If you read the article, there's, there's even a memo he cites the CIA had written to the White House that said that if they could succeed in killing Qaddafi's family, it would emasculate him because uh, Bedouin's supposed to be able to protect his family. So you even have the suggestion of killing his family. Then Sai got the information. They had intelligence 45 minutes before the bombs landed that Qaddafi was at home. And they bombed that point. And he had left since then, apparently. And they did kill his daughter instead. Now, even with the ad admissions like that, coming out, plus the other two cases of evidence. Uh, the editor of the LA Times, his answer to that was, he was said, come on now, we bombed a capital. You know, you're calling that an assassination. I'm saying, wait a minute, the major it media has reported. policy to yeah. hit Gaddafi. That yes. was the target. Even George Shultz said that. <laughs> right. Even George Shultz said that, yeah. and yet the, the editor of the LA Times was, was giving me the White House party line. It was bombing a capital. It's, They've admitted that there's, many people have admitted that there's been a series of attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro over the years, and there's been accusations that the U.S. Uh, was involved in the assassination of Lumumba in the Congo in the 1960s. You yourself were active in that area during that period. Senate investigators brought it out, and it was, it was openly reported. So you have, GM in Vietnam. You in have 62. a situation where the White House, the Oliver North Network, the Reagan National Security Operatives, have been playing hardball, admitting it, bragging about it. Yeah, we were out to kill the bastard, they say about Gaddafi. And yet the, the Congress won't ask the questions that would be natural to follow up on such statements. And the media right. won't publish the article saying, you know, on X date, this staffer said, blah. Therefore, why aren't we asking? Why aren't we probing? No, it, it's too unsavory. Well, John, we've seen in the past and also in the present with this present thing going on in Congress that they have ex-CIA people as members of the staffs, congressional staffs, and liaison people with these congressional staffs and the various government agencies. How It looks to me like it's carefully controlled, if not contrived. But this looks like it's usual. This is a usual thing for the CIA, either present or past operatives and personnel, to link up with key uh, congressional committees that are involved with CIA being, activities. Being less than dumb, the CIA has salted its agents throughout the Congress, every committee. Uh, and it's done this, you know, it did it three decades ago. And we're seeing it once again, but it's standard. For example, when I testified to the Senate Oversight Committee uh, in 77, when my letter came out in you know, the book following, and, and uh, hearings not dramatic like these, but nevertheless on the same subject of perjury and cover-up and law-breaking by the National Security Council and the CIA, um, they guaranteed the Senate, Gary Hart, uh, guaranteed me protection that the CIA would never know the source of this information and uh, Gary Hart personally you know has said that uh, that and and I I was skeptical I said there's no way you can protect me uh, for speaking out and he he made a kind of a pious speech and said you know if we can't protect our sources from these guys what chance do we have of ever getting into the truth of these matters so I testified at length I took his word for it and I testified at length. And then I flew down here to Texas to check my notes to get some more information on Friday to fly back on Sunday to testify again on Monday. 
And when I got up there on Monday, they had already transcribed and sent to the CI my testimony. And, and a